My dear brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. We're grateful to welcome you today for today's devotional. I want to want recognize those who are seated on the stand. My wife, Sister Susan Tanner, our speaker, Matthew O. Richardson, and his wife, Lisa Richardson. We have representatives from the three stake presidencies that serve on campus, as well as uh, President Alfred Grace from the Polynesian Cultural Center and members of the BYU-Hawaii President's uh, Council. We also recognize the students on the stand who are vis visiting with us today, and we want to let you know that next week's devotional on Tuesday will be the Christmas devotional by the music department. We encourage all to come. It should be uh, a lot of fun and very inspirational. Our opening hymn today will be Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, hymn number 72. Our chorister this morning is Nina Jo Sandstrom, and our organist is Rebecca Strain. Following the opening hymn, the invocation will be offered by Abigail Stewart, a senior from Clarkston, Utah, majoring in both intercultural peacebuilding and communications. We'll then hear a scripture that has been chosen and will be read by uh, Raquela Cook, a freshman from Chico, California, majoring also in intercultural peacebuilding. Following the scripture, we'll be favored with a musical number, Oh, How Lovely Was the Morning, played by Liana Foliaki, uh, Foliaki, excuse me, on the viola with, um, did I say that right? <laughs> the viola, viola, <laughs> with Dan Bradshaw on the piano. Uh, I used to confuse that because the Shakespeare has the same name and it's uh, pronounced differently. And now our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord Almighty. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come together as a group of thy children, desiring to be uplifted and to be taught from on high. We ask thee, Heavenly Father, that thou will bless us uh, with the Spirit, that Brother Richardson will be able to speak according to the Spirit, that we may be taught what thou would have us learn. We're thankful for 
the holiday season and for, especially for the Savior, for the real reason to rejoice. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, my brethren, we see that God is mindful of every people, whatsoever land they may be in. Yea, he numbereth his people, and his bowels of mercy are over all the earth. Now this is my joy and my great thanksgiving. Yea, and I will give thanks unto my God forever. Amen.
Thank you, Dan and Leanne, for that music. Today's devotional speaker is Brother Matthew O. Richardson, and he will be introduced by his wife, Lisa Richardson. We're grateful to welcome them from Brigham Young University. Following the, his devotional message, the benediction will be offered by Xavier Natani, a sophomore from Orlando, Florida, who's majoring in anthropology. Xavier served in the California Roseville mission. Now, Sister Richardson. Matthew Richardson was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, and grew up in the same family home his 91-year-old mother is still living in. He grew up with five brothers and one sister, vacationing in the family camper, skiing in the mountains behind his home, eating fried okra, and working hard, picking garlic, stocking grocery shelves, uh, the night manager of a local drive-in, and a ski technician at a sporting goods store. As a boy, he dreamed of being an astronaut or a professional athlete. He loved the Rams, and his favorite player was Roman Gabriel, their quarterback in the late 60s and early 70s. He graduated from Murray High School and then headed south to Brigham Young University, excited to begin his life as a cougar. He served a full-time mission to Copenhagen, Denmark. He loved his mission and has always referred to it as the best two years for his life. He returned to BYU and is and always has been loyal, strong, and true. He received all three of his degrees at BYU, a bachelor's degree in communications, and master and doctoral degrees in education leadership. He, we met while we were both attending school, living in the same apartment complex. The first time we met, he stuck out his hand and gave me his best missionary handshake, having just returned from Denmark four months earlier. I was smitten by that handshake, and I distinctly remember thinking to myself, I want to marry someone just like him. We were married in the Salt Lake City Temple 34 years ago, serving our community, completing our education, traveling the world, but most importantly, serving God and raising four children, building a strong home and family that is centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matt is an amazing husband and father making Mickey Mouse pancakes every Saturday morning, father's interviews every fast Sunday, the brains behind our family constitution, the Richardson Dating Academy, and our family motto. The kids all knew their dad would always be, for them, be there for them. Homework, sporting events, concerts, Pinewood derbies, Valentine boxes, school projects, campaigns. One of his best kept secrets, he sews. And he has made every single one of our kids' Halloween costumes. He is our everything. We have four grandchildren with two more on the way. One of our daughters is expecting twins in March. When Matt first became a grandpa, he joked that he wanted to be called Mufasa. Somehow that didn't stick. He is affectionately called Dadpa, a combination of dad and grandpa, two sacred roles Matt cherishes. Matt is currently serving as the Advancement Vice President at BYU. He's been serving in this capacity since 2014 in overseas athletics, BYU TV, philanthropy, publications and graphics, alumni and external relations, and the devotionals. Advancing the cause of BYU is advancing the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ, something he is fully invested in. Matt served in the General Sunday School Presidency from 2009 to 2014. He's currently serving as a stake president. It is a privilege for me to introduce a man of integrity and honor. He's a simple man. He's all about God and family. He works hard, prays hard, is loyal, committed, and someone you can always count on. A servant, disciple, and friend. He embodies our Richardson family motto, something we say together while kneeling and holding hands at family prayer. Richardson, reverence, respect, responsibility, resourcefulness, and we say it like this, resolve. Besides the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have just met one of the best blessings in my entire life, and that's Lisa. I love how she says that she wanted to marry a man just like me, having shaken uh, my hand. Um, but it took a little bit of work. And so after that experience, I thought, there is a woman with great light. And I want to be her friend, and perhaps a lot more. 
And so uh, I, we would go to her apartment to try to, or I would, to try to meet her, and she was never home. She was just never home. So I'd go there to borrow things, and so I'd show up, and she wasn't home, and then I always borrow things, because that way you get two trips for the price of one. You have to return what you borrowed. And got to the point where I'd go over and I'd say, I was just wondering if you, if you guys uh, have a, 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 some magic markers. And they're like, and her roommates would be saying, Lisa's not here. And I go, what are you talking about? I just need magic markers. And they go, okay, fine, here's your magic markers. And then I'd bring them back and I'd say, well, here's these back. Can I borrow a, um, a, a spatula? Lisa's not here. Well, I'm just borrowing a spatula. But uh, it was something that paid off very well and has been a great blessing in my life. Thank you, Lise. Not long ago, my wife and I attended a choral concert at Brigham Young University. At intermission, I stood to stretch my legs, and the young man standing next to me said, you look like a smart person. Now, let, let me pause right here before I continue. You should know that I have no idea what could have possibly given him that impression. But whatever it was, I wish I knew, because it, um, because it was what he said next. Um, it was what he said next that uh, cemented a memory in my mind. He said this, can you predict the future? What an unusual question to ask a complete stranger, I thought to myself. This is not the fare for the usual intermission chit chat at least not for me. So I assumed that he must be joking, and I half chuckled as I said, I wish I could. Wouldn't that be nice to predict the future? It was immediately clear that this young man was not joking, for his smile faded. He grew quiet, and his demeanor darkened just a bit. I'm sorry, is all I could say. He turned, muttered that he was going to get a drink of water, and left the auditorium. This was strange, I thought to myself again. Just as intermission was ending, ending and the lights were beginning to dim, this young man returned to his seat and quietly sat down beside me. The curtains raised and the concert began again. I don't think I heard a note for the rest of the concert. All I could think about was this young man. Something was weighing heavily upon him, and my mind continued to race. Was he in trouble? Was, why was he so worried? What was he worried about? Was the future weighing so heavily upon him that it would cause him to think to talk to a stranger? Oh, I long to be smarter so that I could actually help him in some way. Oh, how I wished that I could actually predict the future. As I sat in that darkened theater, it dawned on me that maybe his question wasn't really all that unusual. After all, how many of us would like to know a little bit about the future, especially our own future? Throughout the ages, men and women have turned to a variety of sources in hopes of predicting or knowing of the future. They've attempted to read the stars. They consulted with self-proclaimed soothsayers, prognosticators, or others with some mysterious or dark title. Some even tried working with the dark side, which, by the way, was not partnering with Darth Vader or he who must not be named. When I was in college, I wished I could gaze into a crystal ball just long enough to see five years into the future. I wanted to see what it was going to be like, and I wanted to see if I was going to be part of it. If none of these things are available, then perhaps we need to move on to, to more powerful sources than the stars or soothsayers or whatever it might be. For example, we might move on to something that is even the more powerful. And I brought it with me, the magic eight ball. <laughs> this idea was first hatched in a Three Stooges movie in 1940, which by the way should tell us all something about this predictive power. But it took Albert Carter and Abe Bookman to bring this into reality in the 1950s. It works like this. You ask the magic eight ball a question. Will I pass my English class? Turn it over, reply hazy, try again. Will I ever graduate? Better not tell you now. <laughs> Will I ever get a job and be employed? Yes, you can count on it. Whew. Will she say yes? Well. For questions like that, we need to consult an even higher predictive power, power. 
the cootie catcher. <laughs> Some of you know this. This paper origami fortune teller, teller is also known as a chatterbox, a salt seller, a whirly bird, or a paku paku. So what you do is simply say, pick a color, or ask, pick a color. Blue, B-L-U-E. Pick a number, three, one, two, three. And then, of course, your magic fortune is revealed. You will have three kids named Janice, Jeffrey, and Jehoshaphat. Yes, they all begin with a J. You will live in Singapore, drive an old Volkswagen, and you will have a dog named Crimson Dawn. Oh, and you will live happily ever after, mostly. Go ahead and laugh, but I imagine that many of us, if not all of us, have had employed such device, devices or tactics like this all to know our future. And as weird, improbable, and silly as all of this sounds, somehow doing these things actually causes us to feel just a little bit better about our fears of the future. Until, that is, the next shadow of doubt falls upon our path. Thoughts like these and much, much more rattled around in my brain during that post-intermission concert. I then recalled worrying about my future when I was his age, and I felt the need to reach out to him somehow, to say something, to try to help. I wondered if I should fold my program into a cootie catcher and reveal this young man's future after the show, but that didn't seem quite right. Perhaps I should give him some advice or tell him something that I learned from my own experience that may prove helpful. With this in mind, I thought of Elder Boyd K. Packer once saying, young men speak of the future because they have no past, and old men speak of the past because they have no future. Oh no, I thought, my desire to speak of my past experience actually confirms that I am a really old man. Nonetheless, I knew I had to say something more to that young man before he left. Maybe I was feeling what, President, or excuse me, what Elder Jeffrey R. Holland once expressed, quote, we who have already walked that portion of life's path that you are now on, try to call back to you something of what we have learned. We shout encouragement. We try to warn of pitfalls or perils along the way. Where possible, we try to walk with you and keep you close to our side, close quote. As soon as the concert finished and as the house lights came up, I quickly turned to this young man before he could stand. I gently grabbed his arm and looked him straight in the eyes. While I cannot predict what your future will be like, I said quietly, it is possible for you to predict what you will be like in the future. I then handed him my program and said, as I pointed to the scribblings that I had written on the front cover, give it some thought. I, st I, I stood, smiled, shook his hand, and said, trust me, this can really help. And I turned and left the concert. I don't know what happened to this young man. I have not had contact with him since that day. But I do hope that he went home and he read what I had written on my, prog on my program. I sincerely and I earnestly hope that he actually did give it some thought and would give it a try. What did I write? I wrote, search diligently, pray always, and be believing. And all things shall work together for your good. If ye walk uprightly and remember the covenant, ye have covenanted one with another. Doctrine and Covenants, section 90, verse 24. Now you should know that I had underlined the conditional part of that scripture on my program, starting with the word if. If, I love the part of all things shall work together for your good. But as it is often revealed in scriptures, if we do something. So the underlined portion actually read, if ye walk uprightly and remember the covenant wherewith ye have covenanted one with another. I sincerely wish that I had more time to share with this young man why I underlined this part of this powerful and favorite scripture of mine. Sadly, the time and the place did not allow that to happen, so with your indulgence, I will share my reasons with you instead. And I do so in the spirit of Elder Holland's heartfelt sentiments of calling back to you something of what I have learned with a desire to warn of the pitfalls 
and perils along your way. I find the phrase walk uprightly fascinating. The, by definition, this means to walk or to proceed by adhering to rectitude, righteous, honest, or just, according to that which is right. Now that is a mouthful. And it seems logical that if you would want things to work together for your good, then you would need to proceed in righteousness or in accordance with that which is right. And I commend this approach to every single one of us here today. But there's another way to look at this phrase. For example, it may be that we should walk or proceed in, by definition, a raised, erect, or vertical manner, as in a position or a posture. For any of us dealing with the pressures of the future that cause fear, doubt, and discouragement, we know something about Paul's phrase, which describes hands that hang down and feeble knees that could use a little lifting. Some of us are searching and praying, and we're exercising every particle of faith we can muster to be believing. Yet it still feels just a little overwhelming, and hope seems to somehow escape us. What else can we do? Perhaps we must heed Jehovah's counsel to Joshua at a time when doubt was overwhelming all of Israel. Said Jehovah, quote, have I not commanded thee, commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever ever thou goest, close quote. In other words, walk, standing up straight, square your shoulders and raise your neck to see the horizon before you. In times like these, there can be no slouching. There can be no shrinking. We must up walk uprightly. But wait, that is not all. This scripture that I had written on the program says that we must not simply walk uprightly, but we almost stand tall because of the, covenanted we, uh, the covenant we have covenanted one with another. And what covenant might that be? When entering into the baptismal waters, we promise that we, among other things, would be willing to mourn with those that mourn. To be willing to comfort those in need of comfort. And to be willing to stand as a witness for others at all times and places. In other words, we promise to help one another, support one another, be there one for another, and to help others become what they are capable of being. I want to share, you, share with you an example of this very aspect of Doctrine and Covenants section 9024, especially the concept of walking uprightly and remembering the covenant we have covenanted one with another. In 1897, David O. McKay was called to serve as a missionary in Scotland. He was thrilled to return to his motherland and had very high expectations of bringing the gospel, the restored gospel, to his kin. Unfortunately, there wasn't much enthusiasm for the message about God, Jesus Christ, and a restored gospel brought about by a boy prophet with his kin. He was rejected more than he expected. Even when he was able to share his message, he was actually ridiculed for his American accent, that he talked funny and it hurt him deeply. To make matters worse, there was some assertion that the missionaries didn't actually come to Scotland to share a message of restored light, but they actually came to steal their bonny lasses away for plural marriage. Some of you returned missionaries know all too well what I'm talking about. In other words, President McKay experienced a mission. Feeling a bit so uh, sorry for himself, he and his companion went on a diversion for the rest of the day. This is what we now call a P-Day. They went sightseeing, toured the area, and prepared for the next day. Well, it appears that this one diversion day turned into several days of diversion and touring. And on one of these diversion days, David O. McKay found himself standing at the wall outside Stirling Castle, taking in the historic sites before him. He loved Scottish history. 
They left touring the castle around five o'clock to return to their newly acquired lodgings. As the two missionaries walked along Bacco Hill Road, they approached a construction site for new apartment buildings that would be known as the Albany Crescent Buildings. From the sidewalk, David O. McKay noticed something unusual about the building. Over the front door was a stone, something unusual in a typical residence. And what was even more unusual is that he said, I could see from the sidewalk that there was an inscription chiseled in the arch. McKay recalled, quote, I was halfway up the graveled walk when there came to my eyesight a striking motto carved in a stone, what e'er thou art, act well thy part, close quote. While some may conclude that this phrase was unique or even homespun, others will point out that it was very similar to a line not from Shakespeare, but the well-known poem from, um, uh, called The Essay on Man, written by the Eng English essayist, essayist and poet Alexander Pope in 1733 to 1734. In Epistle 4, Pope penned, quote, Act well your part. There all the honor lies, end of quote. Whether the phrase, whate'er thou art, act well thy part, was a variation of Pope's work, or homespun by the architect creating the stone, John Allen himself, or inspired from another sort real, source really doesn't change the inspirational quality. This motto had an immediate and profound impact upon David O. McKay. Of this experience, David Lawrence McKay, David O. McKay's son, said later, quote, this message struck father forcefully, end of quote. And although McKay talked about only the impact that this phrase had upon him, in the lower section of the stone should never be um, dismissed or overlooked. In fact, it appears that John Allen included the lower portion of the stone to emphasize the meaning and application of the motto that was chiseled in the dramatic fashion above on the top part of the stone. You see, immediately below the engraved inscription, what e'er thou art, act well thy part, is an unusual array of nine symbols that are neatly arranged into three rows and three columns. It is my guess that David O. McKay must have noticed these symbols on the stone. In fact, I believe that it was probably the symbols that first captured McKay's interest and, and uh, because those would have been the only part visible from the street. Even though McKay never wrote about or spoke about the symbols of the stone, because he only talked about the motto, but surely when you take the symbols and the motto simultaneously and consider them together, the impression and impact of the motto is remarkably deepened and, and punctuated. When I began looking into the meaning of the symbols on the stone, I was first told that they were linked with masonry, and it was Masonic symbolism. I discovered, however, that there is no evidence that John Allen, the architect or creator of the stone, <clears throat> excuse me, was ever associated with the Masons. And after some effort, it was easy to see that Allen's symbols had no real resemblance to any of the other Masonic symbols at the time. Another source said that the stone contained, these, these uh, symbols on the stone contained navigational symbols revealing the landing coordinates for a UFO invasion. Now, I actually looked into this too, just to be safe. And you'll be happy to know that this too was a false claim. It turns out that each of these interesting shapes actually represent a number, a whole integer. Almost all of the geometric symbols are deciphered by counting the sides that the shape displays. Thus, <clears throat> the top row includes the numbers from left to right, the number five, the number 10, and the number three. The second row has the numbers six, the number eight, and the, and the number four, sorry, do those out of order, four, six, and eight. And finally, the third row contains the numbers nine, two, and seven. When considering the numbers in each row, for example, a distinct pattern emerges. The sum of each number, for example, five, 10, and three, added together in the first row is 18. The sum of the second row numbers, four, six, and eight, is also 18, as is the sum of the numbers nine, two, and seven in the third row. The same pattern actually emerges when viewing the columns on the stone. 
the sum of the numbers in the first column, 5, 4, and 9, from top to bottom, is also 18. And the middle column, when added together, 10, 6, and 2, totals 18. And the same is true of the sum of the third column, 3, 8, and 7. Interestingly enough, the sum of the numbers added dia diagonally of 5, 6, and 7 equal 18. In either direction, they equal 18 as well. These symbols create what is commonly known as a mathematical magic square. The magic of the Albany Crescent Stone that David O. McKay viewed is how the symbolism of the mathematical magic square not only um, underscores the motto of whate'er thou art, act well thy part, but how it actually gives context to the phrase and making it more deep and with greater context. Consider, for example, how the square is only magic when the numbers are in the proper place or order and when the numeric values coordinate with each other and the other values. If, for example, the numbers 5 and 10 of the first row, row were exchanged, the symbol would no longer be considered magical and its overall integrity becomes flawed. Likewise, it would be impossible to replace the number five or any other number in the square, for that matter, with any other numeric value and still maintain the magic. In short, the proper overall outcome is dependent upon each number acting well its part as it relates to the greater whole. Without the magical square symbolism, the phrase, whate'er thou art, act well thy part, still emphasizes the importance of fulfilling one's role or duty. In other words, this phrase could be stated something like, whatever you are or whatever you choose to do, do it well. When linked with the magic square symbolism, however, this message takes on a whole new paradoxical twist. While individualism is still valued and still emphasized, it is really actually valued within the context of its contribution to the success of the greater whole. This is paradoxical simply because both the individual and the group are emphasized at the same time. This is a symbiotic relationship at its best. Not only is the success of both parties dependent upon one another, but the aspects, both aspects, are necessarily defined by each other as well. It is possible that this relationship was understood by David O. McKay, as is evidenced from his musings and thoughts after seeing this stone on his mission. His experience with the stone's message seemed to simmer in his mind and in his heart. As McKay and his companion, Elder Johnston, walked back to their apartment, McKay expressed personal lessons and applications that were forming within him. He thought about his days of playing football at the University of Utah before his mission and told his companion about a custodian and how this humble man helped the football, helped the football team with their gear and even assisted the players uh, with their homework which, by the way, we don't do anymore because that would be an NCAA violation. <laughs> President McKay said of that, of that experience, quote, this custodian was unassuming, unostentatious, but he did his duty well, close quote. Upon reflection, McKay then concluded, I realized that when I had just, uh, that I had just as great as respect for that man as I had for any professor in whose class I had sat. He acted well his part. It is important to point out that David O. McKay was not only seeing the importance of this man who did his duty honorably, but that he may well have been seeing the relationship between the custodian's part, the professor's part, the football team's part, and how each were connected together in the greater whole, the university. You see, it doesn't really matter what number you are, but it does really matter how well you act your number's part. 
McKay then reflected upon his own part as a missionary. He thought of his activities prior to seeing this stone. He and his companion were sightseeing, and even though he was impressed with the landscape, history, and the courage of the Scottish heritage, he decided that this activity was, quote, not missionary work, close quote. He concluded and said, quote, while I am here as a missionary, so I will act my part and be a good missionary, end of quote. Once again, however, it appears that McKay must have understood the greater context of this message. He said that as he was talking with Elder Johnston, he silently thought and said, I thought about this motto, whate'er thou art, act well thy part, and took it as a direct message to me. And I said to myself, or the Spirit said to me, you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. More than that, you are here in the mission field as a representative of the church, and you are to act well your part as a missionary, and you, and you get into the missionary work with all your heart. Close quote. Obviously, McKay could see the importance of being a good missionary, but he was also seeing how that related to the greater context of being a member of the church. He said, I accepted the message given to me on that stone. And from that moment, we tried to do our part as missionaries in Scotland. Of this pledge, David O. McKay's son, David Lawrence McKay, said that his father's rededication was done, quote, completely and wholeheartedly, close quote. Nearly a year after this experience, David O. McKay received a letter of encouragement from his sweetheart, Emma Ray Riggs, who later became his wife. She counseled him to do his work well. Emma Ray's phraseology apparently triggered a memory for David O. McKay. In his response, dated April 25th, 1899, he reminisced on the experience that he had in Sterling with the John Allen Stone. He said, quote, as I again read your letter now before me, a warm feeling of appreciation of your encouraging words came over me, and your advice, do your work well, will ever be remembered. It reminds me of a beautiful inscription carved over the door of one of the cottages in the east part of Sterling. Whate'er thou art, act well thy part. If one only chooses the good part, and does his work well, success and happiness will certainly be his, end of quote. The impact of that stone for McKay extended beyond his missionary service in Scotland. In later sermons, David O. McKay spoke of the connection between the parts of our lives, whether missionary, friend, family, neighbor, country, human race, and every creature, he often attributed his experience with the John Allen Al Albany Crescent Stone as the genesis of sorts to this understanding for him. Remember, he said, this as a guideline in whatever position you are called to serve. He taught in general conference this message once again, whate'er thou art, act well thy part. So, if you are ever filled with doubt, about your future and wonder what it may hold. What can you possibly do? What should you do in times like that? I hope you'll have confidence that all things will work together for your good by searching diligently. Notice it doesn't just say search, search diligently by praying not just when convenient, but praying always. And be believing that God will answer your prayers, make smooth your path or direction, and help you along your way. You can impact your future by what you actually are doing today. So find your part at this stage in your life and go to work right now. 
The stone that inspired change to David O. McKay's life continues to underscore our need to walk uprightly, to stand up straight in times of challenges, to act well our part as we remember to keep our covenant, our covenant that we have covenanted one with another. Please know that just like the stone, where the threes need the fives, that we need each other. Please know that you are needed in this grand scheme and that your number matters. I need you. We need you. And as weird as this may sound, you actually need me. So all the tens, threes, fives, and sevens, they need you too. And you need them. In short, we need each other. And we need you to act well your part. To remember the covenant you covenanted in baptism. That we will be there one for another. So we need you to do your part now and in the future. So act well, for without you, there is and will be no magic. Stiffen your resolve, straighten your back, and make strong your knees. This is what I wanted to tell that young man at that concert as it ended, who wished that I could predict his future. Now, I may not be very smart, and I understand that I am old. So I will embrace just a little more of Elder Holland's remarks about giving advice. He said, quote, When you are young, not all of life's questions and difficulties have, been, have arisen yet. But when they arise, and unfortunately for your generation, they will arise at a younger and younger age. He continued by saying, The gospel of Jesus Christ marks the only sure and safe path. End of quote. A favorite quote of mine is from Corey Tenbloom, a survivor of the awful atrocities heaped upon her in a concentration camp during World War II. She wrote, Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. I know that God lives, that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of him. Please do everything you can to come to know God so that you may know how to move forward into the future, your future, with confidence. It is my prayer that you will search a little more diligently. Pray always, not just when convenient or in or at an urgent need, and that you'll be more believing that you will believe that God's miraculous hand applies just as much to you and to your personal affairs as it does to everyone else. Oh, you just got to believe. I testify that our Father in heaven wants all things to work together for your good and that he will help you and others in this quest. This will come to pass only as you walk uprightly and remember the covenant ye have covenanted one with another. So please, as I've already said again and again, and hope to say as long as I live, stand a little taller, summon a little more courage, and act well your part. We, all of us, we are counting on you. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity that we had to gather here today and uh, be spiritually fed. At this time, Father, we ask you for a blessing upon us as we uh, leave this place, that we may ponder the things that we have learned and that we may allow the Spirit to teach us. And we love thee, Father, and ask for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.